Hi, everybody. It's been an amazing day. I always warn the organizers, please, whatever you do, don't put me on later in the day than my turn, because the expectations are always so sky high. So save the best till last, but, uh, but you have me instead, so I apologize for that. Um, I want to cover um, two broad themes, but really there's, there's three topics. Um, David Rutter, as, as he mentioned earlier in the day, you know, he, he implored me a few months ago to carve out time to, to think more, plan more, um, you know, really, really get back almost to those early days and, and, and do it all over again to make sure that we're sending Cordra in the right direction for the next four years. So, so what I wanted to do was, um, was share two dis distinct pieces of thinking that, that I and we have been doing um, recently um, and then use them to um, explain and inform some of the decisions we're making about where we go next. Um, so you can think of this as, as something like a Cordra, the Cordra State of the Nation, but, um, but in reality it's a bit theoretical to start with and, and then quite practical towards the end. So, so it, will be, it will be a talk in, in three parts. Um, I'll start by almost going back to the, you know, the opening sentences of the opening sentence of the Corda White Paper you know, four years ago where we, we wrote you know, we envision a world where people can transact seamlessly for any purpose without friction. Um, and I know there are many old friends and, um, and familiar faces here, but there are also lots of new faces. So what I'd like to do is take you back to that time and, and, and rather than tell the story I normally tell, uh, put Corda in a slightly different historical context to, to explain you know, why it is the way it is, why it does the things it does, um, and use that to um, you know, explain where we may go next. Um, but of course, that's backwards looking and, it, and it's quite theoretical. So what I'll then do is get to the, the second piece of thinking I did recently, which was, was to really understand what people are actually doing with the platform, make sure that what we thought was the case actually is the case. So I'll tell you about some of the, um, some of the fun I had in the summer where I looked at what people were doing and then had this horrifying realization when I realized they were doing that with Corda. Oh my God, that is not what we expected. But there were some really interesting insights that came out of it. You know, there's the theory and then there's the reality. And once I've gone through both of those, I'll use that to share some thoughts. And they're still early thoughts. You know, the strategy is always an emerging, um, an emerging thing, but some thoughts on, on where we go next. Um, but first, um, you know, we envision a world, you know, what was the, the problem? What is the problem we think Cord is designed to solve? Um, and I think it's always important to, to be clear on that in our own minds, because if we, you know, if, we, if we don't know what it's for, we may apply it to the wrong things or you know, we, may, we may, may solve the wrong problems. Um, now, often when I tell this story, um, you know, I go back 10,000 years and I talk about you know, the history of money and I tell stories about how physical money is very different from digital money. And I use that, I introduce Bitcoin, I use that to motivate blockchain. Um, but I think there's a different historical context that you can use to explain at least some of Corda's value, which is to put it in the context of the evolution of technology and enterprise technology, enterprise IT in particular. Um, so the story I'm going to tell over the next few years is partly Corda, and it's partly the story of my career before Corda, the, the, the story of the enterprise middleware revolution, and how I think what some of the vendors in the 90s and 2000s were doing was almost unfinished business, and Corda is here to finish that business. It's almost as if Corda is what those platforms wish they could have been. So, um, so to do that, let's go back a few years, let's go back a few decades, um, and maybe that, look at a photograph of a bank data center 20 years ago. And, okay, okay, okay. So maybe slightly longer ago than 20 years, but not many. You know, we remember, you know, we should remember, you know, before 1940, 1950, there were no computers. The world ran on paper. They ran on, you know, at best, it ran on tabulating machines. And the, the story almost, if you like, of the, you know, the first wave of IT, the, worst, the first wave of technology, it was about taking existing manual processes and it was about applying computer technology, information technology, to massively improve the productivity of individual firms. You know, moving from paper ledgers to electronic ledgers, electronic records, you know, this is not really a bank, that's, I think that's a monastery. But, uh, but you can imagine you know, the front office, the back office, the books and records of banks implementing systems to, um, to, 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 um, to automate and improve them. But we hit a problem, you know, the industry hit a problem, it had existed forever, but it really became acute from what I can see in, in the 90s, when this, 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 this process, this, this never ending productivity revolution that had been going on since the 60s, it kind of ran in, almost ran into the wall, because what we ended up with was a system almost like the Tower of Babel problem, where within an organization, a huge amount of systems have been implemented, a huge amount of computers to solve different problems but none of them spoke to each other. Um, it was as if you had like, you know, different people working on different things in different parts of the business, but, but nothing was connected. So you could have you know, trades booked in the front office of a bank, but the back office would know nothing about 
granted until later. You, know, you could go into your branch and change your address, but that wouldn't replicate to all the systems. So a insanely huge amount of work began and a huge number of companies have got formed in the 90s and 2000s to go solve this problem. Um, and and there's, there's a really interesting evolution of what these firms achieved because it points us in a direction that tells us something about where we might go. So some of you will remember things like TIBCO and TIBCO Rendezvous. In fact, TIBCO, our, our friends were presenting earlier. And this, you know, the Rendezvous and things like that, they were just like email for machines. It seems like so mundane and, um, and uh, unremarkable now. But these kinds of technologies and IBM MQ series, they allowed one computer to talk to another computer. Something happened over here inside the company and suddenly you could trigger an event somewhere else. Things were beginning to get connected. You know, systems were beginning to be in sync with each other. Uh, but of course, sometimes the systems had you know, different representations of data, different data formats. Sometimes the, the location to which you would route the data would vary based on who it was or, or, or what was being sent. So things like you know, Microsoft BizTalk, IBM Message Broker, you know, application integration emerged, something that could not only receive an event, but could transform it and route it. it was so not, in, not only were we beginning to connect machines, but we were connecting them with a bit of intelligence. You know, in parallel, of course, the internet was taking off. So firms like you know, BEA with WebLogic, IBM with WebSphere, were doing this thing that allowed you know, the old firms who already had a huge amount of technology to bring, that, bring those systems to the internet so you could now open a shop front, take orders, and it would actually flow through to manufacturing fulfillment and all the rest. You know, that whole e-business thing that IBM talked about so much, that's all it was. It was, let's make it possible for people to transact with your existing systems over the web. And then it got really interesting when firms like Pega and Lombardi and these people said, well, if we're going to orchestrate the actions of different machines, what if we could also orchestrate the actions of people and machines, you know, machines and people? So whole business processes could be automated and improved. So technology began to almost coincide with and merge with management consulting as we were able to model processes, you know, optimize them, and then you know, re-engineer them to make companies ever more efficient. So the, the vision of this industry, you know, this thing that became known as middleware, the vision, which was to a large extent achieved, although it has a bad reputation now, was that we could massively improve the efficiency and, um, and, and the, the, way, the efficiency and operations of, of, um, of individual companies. So like happy days, you know, IT has achieved it, its aim would have been the story. But of course there was a problem. All of this technology was designed on the basis that it would be deployed by an individual firm. And of course, so, so these, 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 these servers, these different pieces of software, and they were intended to be installed in data centers in firms. Their, their, their installation was mandated by a CEO or the CIO. You know, they, they, they existed and, and optimized at the level of the firm. But of course, you know, a firm is not a market entity. It's an entity that operates within a market, but within the firm, it's a command and control structure. There's a CEO, there's somebody in charge of the firm. So you have this, have this situation where we spent you know, billions and billions of dollars, achieved huge amounts of, um, of success and optimization, but it's at the firm level, and the software that was optimizing and improving these firms was designed on that assumption. That it was centralized software for centralized organizations. So there was this sort of like, you know, this gap, which was, you know, if you, th if you think about it, is, well, the firms were getting optimized, but if you zoomed out to a market level, the same level of improvement and optimization and efficiency was not being achieved. You almost had this like this almost like this micro optimization where you know, individual firms were getting better and better, but the firms in which they operated were still you know, still littered with emails, faxes, telephones, and paper. Um, as I was putting this together, this presentation, I found this nice stock image that I've used before. It was only when I was like um, looking over the materials again yesterday that I realised, of course, you know, this skyline. You have got the Gherkin there. I think that's the Leadenhall building. This is pretty much a photo of the London Insurance District. You know. You know, the worst example of, um, of, of a market that is still beset by paper. It's not even um, fully automated. So we have this problem that we have you know, firms optimized, but the markets themselves are not. So that, that was the state of technology. Um, you know, the middleware revolution had taken us as far as it could. And this is where I get to Corda and blockchain, because I think the historical context into which we can put is that um, finally we've got the glimmer of an opportunity. We've got the, the potential to say, well, if markets are decentralized, then if we somehow had software that worked in the same way, maybe we could begin to do the same thing to entire markets that the last 20 or 30 years um, were achieved by um, individual firms with, um, with, with, with their centralized software. So I won't rehearse the whole argument for it. This was actually a blog post from this one I link here. It was a blog post from 18 months ago when we, um, when we announced Corda Enterprise. 
But the argument I take people through in that is, if we believe individual firms can optimize themselves, our opportunity is to optimize entire markets. And software that doesn't require those markets to reconfigure themselves to suit the software, but ones where the software has reconfigured themselves to suit the market, um, that, that's the way to do it. So we can talk about, and I won't go into this detail, but for those who are guess, like, new to our community, go and read some of these posts, because I go through an argument about the things we learned from Bitcoin and Ethereum, these decentralized networks that don't require new central operators, but which nevertheless enable a whole collection of participants to form and maintain consensus and achieve some shared business outcome. Yeah, that's what this is all about. So, so when I think about you know, Corda's historical context, this is a big part of my and our thinking. You know, this is, uh, like I say, one way to think about what we're doing is all those things that individual firms achieved through the application of middleware and enterprise software, we've now got the possibility of doing the same thing with, um, with, um, with entire markets. Okay, so that was the theory. Um, so we move, okay, in fact, that was the theory. You know, markets, can, we can now actually optimize processes between the, um, between the firms. That was the theory. Like I say, I also spent some time this summer looking at what people were actually doing with Corda. Um, and, and I joke as if it's sort of like, you know, as if I was horrified. And in reality, I wasn't. Um, I was you know, completely delighted. Um, as I've said many times before, you know, we designed Corda to solve a very small set of, um, of use cases. You know, the original Corda white paper was, it was focused primarily on capital markets. It was solving problems in the back office of large banks. That's what we thought Corda was for. And then four years later, you know, I look at what people are actually doing, and we have people using it in you know, all these different industries, and these are just the ones we know about. So it's, you know, it's, 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 and just looking at this audience here and what we've been seeing today and we'll see tomorrow, it's, it's something that happens very rarely in one's career, that something you think has been designed to solve a very narrow problem is actually something that is being used by other people to solve very different and far broader problems. <laughs> So I thought I should probably understand what people are doing and are they, are they doing what I expected? And, and what I discovered was it seems that right now there are two almost two very distinct, two very separate classes of use case that are being solved um, with Corda. Um, so I did some thinking about you know, why that is, what, what is it in Corda that is, is, is driving people to solve problems in the way they are and where might this be heading? So the first set of problems, or the first set of like, you know, use cases that I see people um, trying to use it for, is possibly what you could call you know, market level business processes. So this is nothing initially, and, and initially is the key point here, this is nothing initially about tokens or digital assets or anything like that. It's using Corda to you know, automate and, and facilitate uh, interactions and business processes between firms. So um, I've just chosen two examples here, you know, the B3I team are in the audience, I think I saw the, the um, Finastra team earlier. But if we just think about what the first phase of, of Fusion Lender comes about, it's all about making sure that anybody who's participating in a complex indicated loan gets the right information at the right time. It's about you know, orchestrating information and, and um, systems and organizations across you know, different organizations, orchestrating them to achieve some business outcome. So if I looked at that, I think, well, that's, that's not what Bitcoin was designed for. That's not what anyone uses Ethereum for. That is a distinct set of valuable use cases, all to do with trying, back to my point about middleware, trying to you know, uh, achieve some like, you know, improved optimal outcome at the market level um, through the application of technology. So I asked, you know, why have, people, why have so many different organizations you know, independently concluded that this, even if it's a staging post to somewhere else, why have they independently concluded that this, you know, that this is something that they can now do and that they should do it with Corda? So I went back and looked at you know, some of the features we added, some for different reasons, some because we anticipated it, and then began to think, you know, how many does Corda have that some of the other platforms don't? So perhaps the most obvious one is something that we probably don't talk anywhere near enough about, but it's the Corda flow framework. Um, I was um, with a client um, a few days ago where we showed it to them. And, and, and it's, uh, for those who don't know, it's, it's a simple way to allow you to write down what the flow of actions is, the flow of activity and information between different participants in, in a business process should be, so that Corda can then automate those processes between firms. It's something that without it, you have to go and implement independently. Um, and you see the sort of like the look of recognition recognition in their eyes um, when they when they especially when they've tried to build this on a different platform now the flow framework is not without its sharp edges and I'll come on to that a bit later it's something that people put a lot of a lot of um, they, they, they rely on it heavily and we need to make it much easier to use safely but there's no denying it's been the facilitator of a lot of successful projects um, um, I won't go through all of these because I need to keep to time but things like Corda's point-to-point -point messaging architecture the fact we don't send data to everybody means you it encourages you to think in terms of data 
data flow and it, there's an intentionality. This information needs to be sent from here to here and then to there. That without having, because there's no gossip protocol, you think in terms of you know, sequences. It makes you think about business processes and it's probably why people are using it for this. Um, internally, we have a lot, of, um, a lot of debate, maybe even controversy about the role of identity in the quarter platform. Should it be tightly integrated or should it be decoupled? Um, and and that's a, there's, a, there's a valid debate to be had there and I'll talk about it more shortly. But there's no denying the fact that in Corda, the way we encourage people to write their apps, when you're sending data, you're not just sending it to an address, an IP address or a host name, you're sending the data to a legal entity. Again, it encourages you to think in terms of business processes and data movement between identifiable parties with whom you're trying to transact. So one way of thinking about Corda and the reason why people are using it today is maybe what we built is kind of like, you know, it's the culmination of the middleware industry's odyssey. It's the next generation application server. And, and so perhaps I shouldn't have been surprised to see how many people are using it for that purpose. But there's a second set of um, use cases I see, which you might think of as perhaps like the more traditional ones, um, or, but maybe, maybe they're not. Maybe it's, maybe it's a new use case of its own. But this is um, organizations like SDX and HQLAX and a whole collection of others who are using Corda to completely transform you know, the structure of the markets in, in which they operate, you know, tokenizing existing assets, tokenizing new forms of asset, changing the nature of how assets are exchanged, moving from T plus two to, to, to T plus zero, um, you know, entirely new ways of, um, of, of transacting and it's interesting to see what these organizations are doing because of course you know there's a lot of overlap in, in the the features of Corda they use but there's a collection of features here that are specifically or targeted or are particularly useful for, for tokens use cases so the underlying UTXO model for those who are familiar with it is, is absolutely critical to this you know Corda can represent um, tokens natively the um, tokens SDK that is, um, has been developed in public the sheer number of people who are contributing to that and filing bugs and issues and trying to improve it tells us that it's it's it, it, it's really captured people's imagination and is solving a real problem. Um, and even things that we talked about in the abstract but are now being proven to be useful for in reality are things like the fact we have multi you can support multiple notaries on the same network. So if you have issuers who are slightly concerned about who can notarize their transactions, who can, who can control their states, you, know, you, can, you can have them tied just to some notaries rather than all of them. There's quite a lot of flexibility in the design. So it was just interesting, at least to me, as I looked at this over the summer, I was trying to, I, I kind of knew that were these two different types of use cases, but it was quite instructive to try and figure out from speaking to people and also just from introspection, you know, why they were doing that and which parts of Corda were useful. Because of course that will also inform where we spend more time to, um, to improve and, and extend things in the future. But when I actually spoke to the teams who were supporting these clients, and this is a general comment now, not specifically about the, the logos I just showed, what struck me really forcefully was that what we could see today, whether it's market level business processes or tokens and assets, that was just the current implementation. Some organizations had started by trying to improve you know, cross-firm business processes. Other, others had started by trying to you know, issue, um, issue and manage the life cycle of different types of assets. But almost without exception, um, what they all had in their plans for the future was the convergence of both of these. So if we take um, just um, take one, I mentioned Lendercom, you, you, you read and think about the vision for that. Phase one is about information sharing. It may not sound that exciting, but the long-term vision there is to you know, tokenize tranches of these syndicated loans to enable a new secondary, um, secondary market in them. That vision only works if you have the business process side and the asset side. And as I look at all these, all these projects, I see the same level of you know, vision and, um, and farsightedness in almost everybody I speak to. But of course there, it's a different set of features that I think are useful. It's the fact that Corda is an integrated platform. It has all these features in one place. It's the fact that we, people aren't doing this yet, but we strongly believe they will. They will want to have multiple applications supported on the same node or on the same network so that a payment you receive in one context can be used in another. So these things we put in support for in the early days, even though people aren't using them, they're betting on us that we will deliver on them because when they get to the next phase of their project, it had better be ready. Um, and of course, um, for those who, um, those, who are, those who are able to join it, called a network which has a, a neutral open admission policy, a clear rule book, um, you know, gar gar which gar then guarantees interoperability and compatibility is, is, is a key way of delivering that. 
So, so that's, that's what I wanted to talk about um, with um, you know, what people are seeing. But it gets us back to the same point when I talked about you know, the, the middleware context, which is you combine both of these, you know, the, the vision of all the firms I've seen present today and tomorrow, the, the, the implication of what they're doing is the market or industry in which they operate will be transformed at the end of this. You know, this is hard work. It is not easy to get, uh, get a multi-firm network of any kind of software live. But the payoff at the end is, is you know, the, the, the dream of the payoff at the end is, is worth it because we, we are trying to improve and optimize our industries in the way that the middleware industry helped people do their individual firms you know, 20 years before us. So, so that's, uh, that, that's the thinking I was doing over the last few months. You know, I guess to, you know, to recap, you know, you know, part one, you know, can, we, can we explain you know, Corda's um, like relevance to business in the context of what individual firms did 20 years ago and extrapolating that to individual markets now? And then can we test that against what people are actually doing and what they say they plan to do? And I think those two things, at least I hope those things um, come together um, quite nicely. So given all that and given our own, um, you know, our own, um, our own thinking and our own prep, you know, where do we go next? So um, Todd and uh, Mike um, from, from um, you know, Todd, head of product and, and chief product officer, and Mike, did a lot of thinking over the summer um, to try and put some, some thinking and structure around a, a proposed um, roadmap for, um, for future, future work, a way of thinking about what we do next. And I think they did it quite elegantly by breaking it into these three categories, uh, the idea of simplifying Corda, um, enabling, um, enabling more connections, and enabling more transactions. So I'll just, in the, in the remaining couple of minutes I have, I'll just give you a taste of, of what this means and, and how we're using this to, um, to, to, to calibrate where we spend our effort. So the first one is, it is, and this is the, this is the near-term priority, um, you know, we have to make it easier for people who deploy on Corda to be successful. It will reduce the time it takes from when you start your project to when you're actually getting value from it. You know, as excited as I am and the R3 team are about Corda, Corda is just a means to an end, and the end is delivering value and improving a business process or improving something for, for a market. So we have to make it easier. The good news is we put a lot of optionality and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of bells and whistles into Corda four years ago because we didn't really know what people were going to do with it or what would be valuable. But as I was talking about in the second part of this transaction, the second part of this, um, this speech, you know, we can now see that the flow framework is utterly critical. The tokens SDK is extremely valuable. You know, we now know almost like where the hotspots in the code are that really have to be made you know, better, simpler, have better guardrails. But we can also see the parts that, you know what, we thought they'd be useful, but maybe they're not as important as we thought they were. So there's a huge amount of effort. It's already been going on over the summer, and it will continue to, to simplify the experience for users of Corda, make it better for developers, make it better for operators. And you can almost think of this as trying to reduce the current complexity budget to free up you know, additional capacity to put other things in afterwards. So this is the, the near-term priority for the engineering team, just making it easier for people to deploy. And for those of you, and I know several of you are in the audience, who've been going live with Corda in the summer, or all the experiences you've had, you know, we're using that to, um, to, 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 to make things better. But we then have to get ahead of this because um, you know, coming down the line is the fact that you know, people do want their applications and their business networks to interoperate. Um, so I kind of half joke, but um, part of my job description I think now is to identify and ruthlessly eliminate any barrier to interoperability between applications and between Corda applications. Because people are going live now and people are going to follow the, you know, the, the easiest path, whether it's running their own network or running, joining Corda network, uh, writing their apps in whatever way it is. But this, this vision that we're outlining works best when apps can seamlessly interoperate, or at least two, two apps that are running on Corda can work better than they would if one was on Corda and one was on some other platform. So there's a lot of work that will be kicking off in, in the office of the CTO to say, you know, what, if anything, can we do to make it even easier to join Corda network, you know, identify and remove objections so that it becomes, you know, it, it's safe and easy for people to join. But then also for people who can't or won't join, what, if anything, and there's always that, there's always that qualification because I'm an engineer and my boss is sitting in the front row, what can we do to make it easier for apps that are not on the same Corda network to interoperate in a way that would be worse if it was not Corda. So there's a lot of work to come on that, and, and um, some of that will, um, when we get to that right point, will, will, will involve the whole community in it. Um, and then finally, um, it, we've learned a lot about what people want to do on their life, and of course everybody wants to be able to settle their transactions. So there's a huge amount of work we need to do to take the call a settler and make it support you know, even more settlement venues and even more settlement rails, and then expand the accounts work and the tokens work to enable far more native issuances of assets onto the network. 
So you end up with this vision to you know, simplify the platform so people can get live with their first, get live more easily with their first phases, make sure we don't do anything that would make it unnecessarily difficult for applications and networks to connect with each other and do both of those in order to enable people to do what they actually want to do, which is to you know, settle transactions without error and do so seamlessly. So, so that's, where, that's where we're going. Um, but I should pause, and this is, I guess, my final point um, before, I, before I end. Um, you know, the ambition I outlined at the start, you know, it's, it's a little bit mad when you think about it. You know, it's, you know, to transform even one market is, you know, is, is, the, is the work of a lifetime of an entire army of people. And yet we're purporting or hoping to build a platform that would allow many people to do this to many industries. So, so I talk a lot about you know, the fact that Corda runs on Java, and that, you know, that sounds like a, sort of like a tedious technical detail, but it's really important. And it's not that it runs on Java, that, that is a detail, but the fact that Corda is strongly affiliated with and strongly builds on a huge development ecosystem is absolutely critical because you know, there's another platform out there that has, a, has, has an ambition in a few years to have a million developers programming for it. A million is not enough. You know, we need 10 million. There needs to be like you know, all 12 million Java developers need to be able to use core run platforms like it. Because if all those developers in the last 20 years were working inside organizations, you know, the next 20 years, a decent proportion of them are going to be working on projects between organizations. So it's why we build on Corda. It's why we need to have as many people as possible who can develop on it. Um, I had really interesting experience, I think it was yesterday, with Case, who used to be in developer relations and is now um, in product management. And I saw Saw him live demo Corda to a to um, to, um, to, to, to a group of um, group of people in London, and um, and they're currently using a different platform. But it was so powerful to watch him do it because he pulled up IntelliJ, just a regular Java IDE, and just started live coding a Corda app. It's pretty basic, just a few fields, you know, buyer seller. You know, um, it wasn't that much. But the thing that kind of finally forcefully struck me was the thing that I think wowed these people as much as Corda, and I'm sure, and I hope they enjoy Corda, it was how easy the process was made because it was running on a regular IDE. We inherited all that innovation and all that extra power from the ecosystem. You know, so much of the code is also generated, all the syntax highlighting, stuff that doesn't sound that much but is massively important to people's productivity. We got it in quotes for free because we were building on the shoulders of giants. We were standing on the shoulders of giants. Being part of such a big ecosystem is absolutely critical. So I guess and this really is my final point. It's why I was so delighted today to see that get broadened even further. Because of course, you know, job is where we began, but then we saw today presentations from Web3, from, um, from, um, from Truffle, and of course, you know, it's, um, it's, it's no secret that, um, that, um, that Corda is one of the platforms that the digital assets demo will run on, and it's my aspiration that Corda will be the best platform so you know, if 12, developers, 12 million developers is not enough, let's expand Corda to be accessible to an, to an even broader audience. So that's all I wanted to say. Um, you know, for those of you who are new to the Corda ecosystem, it's, it's delightful and amazing to have you here. Um, and, excuse me, delightful and amazing to have you here, and I hope the, sort of like the historical context was, was useful. Um, to those of you who are building on it, um, it it's, it's amazing to learn what you're doing, but also to learn what your thoughts are, because that helped inform the second part of the pitch. Um, and, um, and then where we go for the next four years, um, you know, watch this space, there's a lot to come. So thank you very much for your attention.